Hi, I'm David Desteno, professor of psychology at Northeastern University, and this is uh, another of the uh, interview series that I'm doing with June Gruber on communicating psychological science with the public that is sponsored by the Association for Psychological Science. Today, I'm, I'm happy to be here with Dave Nussbaum. Dave wears many hats, unlike many of our other uh, interviewees. He teaches behavioral science at the Booth School of Business. He's a senior science editor for the Behavioral Scientist Online magazine. He's also the founder of Psychgeist, which is an organization uh, that strives to disseminate and share psychology with the general public, public directly from scientists. And he's also a seasoned opinion writer himself. So Dave, thanks for, for coming here today and, and sharing your wisdom with us. Really good to be here. Thanks for, thanks for having me. So I know you've worked with many members of, of our community on trying to get their work out there as, as well as doing your own writing. So I wanted to start by asking you, what do you think are, are some of the biggest barriers that psychologists face in thinking about trying to get their work out there while they're trying to do the business of science as well? Um, I think it's, it's just a question of when you haven't done it many times, uh, you don't necessarily always know how to go about doing it. And so it seems like it's a big investment of time and effort. Uh, and so a lot of what I try to do to help people is to really minimize that. If you write, if you're a <clears throat> prolific uh, op-ed writer as a, as a uh, psychologist, you're still only writing a few pieces a year. And so it's kind of hard to know, build up a network of editors that you work with or know which outlets are going to be particularly interested in what pieces. Um, and so it's really those kind of barriers to entry where it feels like um, a lot of psychologists have really interesting contributions to make into the, um, the general conversation around science, around uh, where psychology fits into society, but because they don't quite know how to get started or how much uh, work they're going to have to invest into it, how much time they're going to have to invest into it with, a, with an uncertain return, um, you don't get started. And so um, generally, I really encourage people to, to, um, to give it a go. And if I can help uh, make that easier, then I'm happy to do that. Okay, well, you're helping today by helping us share this knowledge. So let me, let me ask you another question along that line. You have lots of expertise in sharing pitches with venues up and down the kind of prestige and scale ladder, um, you know, New York Times, Scientific American, the conversation, LA Times, et cetera. So what do you think makes an idea ripe for a, for a pitch and, and, and how should we think about framing it and where to send it? The bar for an idea to be ripe for a pitch is that it's interesting. There's something new there that's interesting that people don't know. Once you have that idea, how you're able to frame it and how it fits into the sort of conversation of the day is going to determine where it's worth sending. It. So if it's an advance that's interesting to science, scientists, other psychologists, but not necessarily to the general public, then it's going to go to, to one set of uh, outlets. Uh, if it's something that the broader public really should know about, or if your research or your, um, your knowledge can speak to an issue of the day, uh, then the way that I go about doing it is I, I encourage people to write a pitch. It's five to six sentences to kind of capture that idea. And that will very quickly give you a sense, uh, certainly gives me a sense because I've seen you know, hundreds of these by now, whether the idea has, has legs. Uh, whether it is telling, so uh, it's easier maybe to get concrete. Uh, for the New York Times, uh, there's no idea almost that's going to be a slam dunk that you're going to get. You're going to get your. I hear it. I'm like, yes, they're definitely going to do that. But um, but of ideas that have a have a shot, um, I think that that, uh, that there's no there's no formula because it can be it can be a research finding. Uh, that that is is interesting. Um, that you're able to frame it in a way that connects to people's uh, lives, how they live them, or can be sort of intellectually stimulating. Um, but it has to be the 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 currency for an editor. There is that people uh, feel like they're learning something new, right? That they're they're it's not something that they felt the new all along, and that in itself can be a bit of a challenge because people do. Uh, how you present new information is going to uh, make a big difference in whether people think it's 
feel that it's new or you're telling them something that they, they kind of felt like they already knew all along, um, which they're, they're happy to, to jump to that conclusion, even if it's not necessarily right. So how should somebody think about that? You know, you, you could be thinking, is this right for the New York Times or the LA Times or the Washington Post or something like the conversation or Scientific American? So if I have a, 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 a finding that's interesting in just terms of the science itself, maybe it doesn't have the legs or the scope that the Times might be interested in it, but what are those other venues that I should be thinking about? Um, so Scientific American is a great example of an outlet that, um, will publish a lot of work if it's um, scientifically sound and it's written in a reasonably compelling way. Mm -hmm. um, so where at the New York Times, uh, out of a hundred pieces I get, we might get sort of a, a handful of them in there, the Scientific American is sort of on the other end of the spectrum. Um, but uh, strategically, I don't know if this is the way you're going with the question, but strategically I will there are a lot of pieces that kind of fall in between where I'll try pitching them to the New York Times. I'll see if I can frame it or help, uh, help the researcher frame it in, in, a, in a compelling way uh, and, and roll the dice, try it at the, the New York Times, try it at the Boston Globe and uh, uh, different times, but right? sometimes it's just a matter of, of luck. Uh, you hit the, the editor at the right time and they find the idea compelling. Um, You've presented it in a way that resonates with something they've just read or they've just been thinking about. And, uh, and if that doesn't work out, that's usually when I go uh, down, the, down the line a little bit uh, to a place like Scientific American, which I think is, um, is a really valuable outlet to be contributing to. The Conversation is another one you, you mentioned. That's one that publishes um, academic op-eds. Uh, once you've placed something in, a, in an outlet that, uh, that has an established reputation, uh, getting that out uh, over social media becomes a lot easier. Uh, and that's where a lot of the, the traffic in the, this writing actually happens. Not that many people are going to scientificamerican.com and browsing through the articles and deciding what to read. It's very much a question of uh, somebody tweeting, I read this in Scientific American and that carrying uh, more weight. So along those lines, you were saying you've seen lots of pictures come through. You've also worked on lots of manuscripts with people. And so what are some of the most common problems that you find with academic writing in terms of helping people make the translation to what a mainstream editor as opposed to an academic editor is looking for? So there's a couple of things. Um, one is that uh, sometimes psychologists, scientists have a bad reputation for writing for popular audiences. And um, I, I don't, I find that almost everybody I work with is able to write reasonably, uh, reasonably well. It's a question of making sure you're oriented to the right audience. That we spend a lot of our time as, as, as scientists thinking about communicating with other scientists. And it almost feels like that you need to, to put in place some sort of ritual that makes you think you're sitting in front of a, cl a classroom of, uh, of 10th graders and talking to them or um, uh, just, just, really mindfully recognizing that you're not talking to the same audience anymore, that this is an audience that isn't taking a class that you're teaching that has to be there, who has to be there and learn what you have to say. It's entirely optional then for them to read. So you have to engage. Them. It's your, it's your job. Uh, if you want them to read, to give them a reason to do that. Um, the other sort of more pragmatic thing that I think is really worth keeping in mind and where I spend a tremendous amount of time uh, in editing, um, are the opening couple of paragraphs of a piece. Um, when we write an academic piece for a psycho psychology journal, uh, there's always an abstract at the beginning of our piece, and we forget about that. When you uh, dive into the manuscript, the reader already has a really good roadmap for That's where you're going, and they have the scaffolding for understanding not only, not only your general point, but how you're going to get there, and how, what you're going to argue, what your conclusions are going to be. And so when you open up the introduction of a, of a uh, paper in psychological science, you can dive into the, you can sort of start, um, you can assume a lot of knowledge that they've, they've gotten from the abstract, uh, give them a background, build up your theory to the point at which, you know, A is true and B is true, and therefore we hypothesize that C will be true. And you can't do that in an op-ed. With an abstract, the reader knows what the payoff is going to be already. 
Exactly. Um, here, why am I going to bother reading five minutes of this if I don't know where it's going? Exactly. And yeah. so many of the first drafts that I get do that. They they present a problem and then they they present sort of another sort of conundrum. And I'm at paragraph four or five and I still don't know what the point is. Yeah. And I still don't know what the takeaway is going to be. And um, once you fix that problem, uh, the writing becomes a lot easier. And so the way that, that the, there's a template that I use that isn't necessary to use, um, but is enormously helpful, especially for the kind of five, 600 to 1200 word piece that most of these are going to be, uh, you know, if you're writing a 4,000 word piece for the Atlantic, it's going to look a little bit different. Um, but there, the opening consists of two paragraphs or sets of paragraphs that come, uh, one after the other. Uh, the first one is what journalists call the lead. It draws you into the article. It gives you some sort of uh, interesting thing that, that, that it's, a, you know, it's an anecdote, something that happened. Uh, it can be um, something out of the news headlines, but it presents the problem. It frames the problem in some sort of interesting way. Like, mm -hmm. I, I'd like to read about that. Then that's followed by uh, the nut graph. Uh, so that's basically the paragraph that is essentially your, your abstract. Uh, it's not written like an abstract, but you're really trying to convey everything there that, um, that is the core of the thesis you're trying to get across. So I've told you what the, I've, I've introduced the problem and now I'm gonna tell you uh, really succinctly what, what it is we're talking about. And then this is a place where uh, one of the problems that, uh, that scientists have is that it's a, it's a place where you're gonna make some claims that you're not gonna substantiate. That's um, right, that's right. One of my, I'll, I'll admit one of my biggest problems in learning how to write these types of pieces and I think it's shared by many scholars is, we want to demonstrate that we understand everything. We understand all the nuance. We've got a great grasp of the landscape. And to do that, you've got to lay everything out before you say, and here's what I'm going to tell you. And the average op-ed reader on Google does not have time or motivation to wade through that. As you said, they want to know what's the payoff before yeah. they invest their time. Right, and you're, you get to go back and explain yeah. it. It's not like these are, these are claims that are going to remain unsubstantiated, but you have to make the big, bold claims up front yeah. and only later circle back and, and explain. Now that I know that I have a scaffolding of what the argument you're gonna make is going to be, I can now make sense of why you're leading me down this path of, of argumentation. Uh, and again, you should be doing that in the academic articles as well, only you have the abstract to help you do that. So there, there's, a, yeah. there's, there's a scaffolding already in place. Um, if I don't know as a reader why you're explaining this background theory or that background theory, I don't, I don't know how I'm supposed to take those building blocks and use them to, 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 to understand what you're trying to convey to me. Um, you know it as the writer because you've you've already gone all the way down the, that path, but I don't know it as the reader, and so there's a there's a curse of knowledge problem uh, with this sort of thing. And so one way that I talk about it for people is that if somebody read your opening, uh, you know your your lead and your nut graph, and then they had to put down the article, they had to click away. Uh, they don't know um, what your evidence is. They don't know if they agree with you or not, but they should be able to tell somebody else what your article is about. If they've read your first two paragraphs and somebody asks them, what is the article about? And they say, I don't, I don't really know. Then you, you, haven't done it. you haven't done it right. Fair enough. Um, and then after that, my, with 90% of people, uh, if you've got a strong opening, the rest of it really writes itself. You know all that stuff, right? Now you've made your claim and now here's why I'm, I'm, how I'm going to substantiate it. There's a lot of... Uh, there's a lot to learn about, you know, how much detail to put into the studies, uh, how much information you want to get across. Uh, one problem people have is, is trying to say too many things, right? Here, you know, the New York Times wants to publish what I have to say. I should tell them everything I know. And it's hard to have the, um, yeah. Yeah. The, the, the discipline to no, just say that one thing. I, I, one of my professors in, in college told me this, and I believe it's true. He says, a professor's worst lecture in a, in a class is the topic that she or he knows the best that they work on. Mm -hmm. Because they will tell you all- One more thing, I said this, this is really- care about. Yeah. Most people don't yeah. care about, right. All right, um, along these lines, let me ask you another question that, that, that I think is relevant today, especially, and, and that there's been debates about on Twitter, et cetera. And that is, how do you advise people, or how do you think about yourself about when 
a claim is strong enough to bring it forward to the public, especially if it's something that's controversial or has policy analyses, um, because there's a tension, right? That is, you want to say something that you know you can defend. Yeah. But at the same time, it can take a long time to build a corpus of, of work up to rule out every possible alternative. And so, and so when you work with people, how do you advise them about threading that needle? So it's, it is a dilemma because there is no perfect answer. Um, I mean, I think that when you're writing for the public, uh, there's a lot of responsibility on your shoulders because you're, it's, your, it's your own integrity that's on the line, but it's also the fields. Uh, if you're out there making up unsubstantiated claims, that's undermining the credibility of the, the entire field. Mm -hmm. um, so you really want to take that very seriously. You want to be very transparent and very, uh, very clear on what you know and what you don't know, but it's, it can be challenging. Um, partly because editors are going to want to pull back some of your hedges. They don't want to publish a piece that says, well, we don't really know anything, but we suspect maybe possibly uh, this. Um, even if you hedge, the reader is still going to leap to conclusions that you're more confident than you are, even if you say you're not, you're not fully uh, confident. Um, at the same time, the, the tension in the other direction is that if you're not willing to say anything when you have evidence for it, then you're, you're seeding the conversation to people who are very happy to say things without any evidence for it. And there are plenty <laughs> of those people out there. There are plenty of those people out there. Yeah. yeah, I was just watching a congressional hearing this morning, and okay. there are plenty of those people out there making policy with no evidence. Yeah. Um, sometimes evidence is the enemy. Uh, and so I think you have to have the courage to stand behind um, behind the evidence that you have gathered, that you that the field has gathered, um, but trying to be humble about it. I mean, you can't explain in every op-ed, you know, that all science is provisional and that right. uh, uh, we're not certain of these things and things are likely to change. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm blanking on the person who named Sam Arbusman, I think, wrote a book uh, in the last decade called The Half-Life uh, of Facts. And it's a really worthwhile, uh, I'm going to butcher exactly what he says, but the, the, the worthwhile takeaway to me is that all the science, all every claim that you make is going to be very much provisional and very much sort of bulldozed away to make for new set of facts mm -hmm. somewhere down the road much less far down the road than you think than you think it is. And so if you cling too tightly to the idea that there are universal eternal facts and you don't quite have them yet, and you're going to wait until you have them before you participate in the conversation, you're going to be waiting a long time. Agreed. Um, you need to try to move the conversation forward, try to move the policies forward with the best, um, the best evidence you have and try to be as transparent as possible on the limits. And here, yeah, and I mean, to me here, I think is one place where thinking about your, and oftentimes we're saying, don't think about talking to your colleagues because they're not the audience for these typical pieces and how you would explain things. But in this realm, I think it is important. So for me, it's, if I know that I could stand up at APS conference or whatever <laughs> conference and feel and confidently defend the claim, then I feel comfortable going forward with it. If I have any hesitation about confidently defending that claim, then to me, that's a cue that it's a little too provisional to go forward mm -hmm. with. Not yep. that, of course, next year, the year after, we're not going to learn something new that's going to put a boundary condition on that factor change. If I think that's a way to think about it. All right, but can, we, Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's true. I think you, this is, this, you hear this, um, I've heard this with book authors in particular, that's hard because you're trying to write a book that the public will read, mm -hmm. but you're also trying to write a book that your colleagues will respect. Yeah. And I think that's a worthwhile line to, to walk. Um, and, then, and then to be really, really signpost your speculation. I think it's okay to speculate uh, as long as you're clear that you're not saying I'm a scientist and I know this, yeah. but that this is sort of informed speculation sure. um, and try to delineate that. So let me close by asking one last question. Um, and again, I, you know, each of us, you, me, we've had our own experiences writing. And there's lots more failures than, than successes. One of the best pieces of advice I ever got, even in being an academic, um, was my postdoctoral advisor, Rich Petty, said, 
uh, if, if you can't handle that the modal answer is no, don't be in this business. Um, and we all kind of build up a, a thick skin with, with rejections at journals. Um, yeah. But I think my experience, at least initially, I think with people that I've coached and worked with is sometimes the no's for these pieces, people take harder. And I think it's because you only see the successes, right? You see the pieces that are published because those are the ones that are chosen. You don't see all the ones that the editors right. pass. And so I guess, how do, you, how do you set people's barometers for what to expect in doing this and, and when and how to be persistent? So inevitably, there's going to be a lot of uh, rejections and it's easier to give this advice than to, to execute it, but you really, it's important not to take it personally uh, because it very often isn't personal. Uh, uh, there are a lot of times when you're not going to get an email back uh, after two or three days and it's not because they read your, your, um, your draft or your pitch and they didn't like it. It's because they haven't got to it yet because they, they have 300 others. Um, I've got a lot of emails back also that say, thanks, not for us. Mm -hmm. And you kind of, pick it up and go to the next place. And one of the things that I, I, um, I really do try to do is try to find a home for, for each thing. So even if it, it's disappointing that a piece felt really good and it could have gone into the New York Times or the Washington Post uh, and it ends up uh, right on the, um, in the conversation, that's still, uh, you know, there's more people are gonna read your, your piece in the conversation. Uh, then are probably going to read the last, the last five years of pieces you've written for academics or anything else. Um, and so some persistence is really, uh, really worthwhile. And if you don't take it too personally, that it's easier to kind of keep on uh, moving down the road. Uh, it can be difficult if all you're getting, if you're doing this on your own, mm -hmm. um, and all you're getting is thanks, but no thanks, or, or no response at all, uh, to, to be able to tell when it's not you, it's just the timing is wrong or the editor was in a bad mood or, or, or they, just, I mean, I've had the last few months have been so busy uh, for the newspapers that I've had people write back to me and say, we really like this piece, but we can't publish it because we have too long a queue to distinguish between that. And when your writing is just, it's just not quite there. It's not quite right. It's not, uh, it needs to be re restructured or, or, or reconsidered in some different way. And so um, if it does feel like you're on that fence and you're, you're not sure whether it's uh, whether it's good. Then I, I I would reach out to someone, um, somebody else who's written for for the public before, um, to give you some sense of of whether this is um, a problem within the writing or a problem that that can be solved by persisting by sending it to the to the next place down down the road. Good advice. All right, Dave Newsom, thanks for joining us and sharing uh, sharing your thoughts. Thanks very much for having me.